huge pleasure to have Baptiste Louf joining us from Uppsala. Um, and he's going to talk about combinatorial maps versus hyperbolic surfaces in large genus. Um, over to you, Baptiste. Well, thanks a lot and thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to, it's always a pleasure to talk about math to other people. Um, so yeah, as Christina said, I'm going to talk about combinatorial maps and hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, so just before I start, this is a joint work with Svante Janssen, who is also here at uh, Uppsala University. And so roughly speaking, uh, I'm going to tell you about two uh, models, uh, di two different models of uh, random surfaces. So one is the combinatorial maps and the other one is hyperbolic surfaces. And uh, the, the purpose of this talk is to try to relate these two models of, of uh, uh, geometry of surfaces. There's many, uh, many, many ways of uh, defining a model uh, of random surfaces. Here are two of them, and I'm trying to relate uh, them. That's, that's basically the, the aim of the talk. Uh, also, I don't know what the audience is familiar with, so I try to keep the talk uh, simple and not too many details and to try to give an informal introduction uh, both to maps and hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, however, do not hesitate to interrupt me at any time if you have a, a question or anything like that. It's all right, I am not pressed by time. All right, so then let's get started. I will start uh, with maps, uh, with uh, give you, uh, giving you an informal introduction to maps. So this is uh, more or less my domain of expertise. And um, so what is a map? Uh, roughly speaking, a map is uh, a discrete surface. What it means, it's, more and more details is that it's the data of some polygons and uh, the gluing along their edges to create a surface. So the surface has to be uh, in this talk, compact, connected and oriented. And um, also everything is um, combinatorial. So it's everything is up to orientation preserving homeomorphism, which means for me, a triangle is a triangle, uh, like all the triangles are the same, all the rectangles are the same and so on and so forth. And um, so in particular, there's a finite number, uh, given a set of polygons, there's a finite number of ways to create a, a map. Like there's a finite number of different maps that you can create out of these polygons. And an, an important uh, parameter of maps uh, is the genus, instead of genus, so the genus, uh, that which we will denote by G, is the genus of the underlying surface of the surface that you create with your map. And it's roughly speaking, the number of handles of your surface. So um, the sphere has genus zero, then the torus has genus one, and then genus two surface is just the double torus and, and so on and so forth. And here uh, you, can, you can see you have an example of a map of the torus. All right, and as I said, uh, today I'm talking um, about um, random, random objects. So there's many, many things you can do with maps. You can enumerate them, you can try to understand their geometric structure. And, um, but what I'm gonna focus on today is to st the study of random maps. And when you study random maps, the question, the typical question is, uh, what does a large random, random map look like? Uh, of course, this is a very vague question, and then you have to focus on some observables and to define things properly. Um, so there's there's several questions, there's several un underlying questions, and uh, so far most of the work on random maps has been done uh, in the setting of uniform maps of the sphere. So the setting is you take, for instance, uh, triangulations of the sphere, for like so um, a sphere built only with triangles, and you try to understand what it looks like. Um, as the number of triangles goes to infinity. So that's the, the, what large means. And the main result in the study of random maps is the um, identification of the so-called scaling limit uh, by Le Gall and Miamont, uh, which you can see a simulation here, a uh, 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 picture due to Jeremy Bettinelli. And this is a continuous fractal object that is called uh, the Brownian sphere. So that's for a bit of history, but I'm not going to focus on, on planar maps, actually. I am going to focus on like the extreme opposite. So whereas while most of the, the works on random maps has been done on maps of the sphere, and 
quite recently, in the, in the past few years, people have started getting interested at uh, looking at hygienist maps. And a hygienist map, uh, the question is now, what does a random uniform map look like when both the size and the genus go to infinity? So of course, for the moment, I'm, I'm hiding a couple of things uh, under the carpet, especially like this N and G, you have to specify how far, how fast they go to infinity with respect to each other. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make it more specific uh, uh, when I come to concrete examples. Uh, but the main interest in this mo model is that if you, in the, there's a notion of average discrete curvature that you can calculate. And when both the size and the genus goes to infinity, the discrete curvature is negative and bounded away from zero. And so you expect some hyperbolic properties. And uh, so that's, that's, that, that, that's why people start getting interested in these hygienist maps. And we already have a few results um, in, this, in this regime. And one of them is um, uh, due to uh, Thomas Budinski and myself. And um, we identified the local limit of the hygienist triangulations. So that's um, by opposition to uh, the slide uh, before, the scaling limit, the question you ask is, what does your map look like from afar? And the local limit, roughly speaking, you want to know what it looks like in the neighborhood of a given point. And the answer it is it looks like this. And well, in this hygienist maps, there's many, many open questions that remain. Uh, of, of course, like global properties, like their diameter, or uh, the asymptotic enumeration of these, these objects um, that comes with it. Uh, it's not directly a problem of random maps, but it's highly related. And yeah, uh, but um, so there, there's more open problems than, than closed problems in this, in this field. Uh, and, but this is not what I'm gonna talk about today. Today, I'm gonna focus on a simpler model called uh, unicellular maps. And a unicellular map is just a map uh, which has only one face. So basically you think of it, it's just, you take a single polygon and you fold it uh, along itself to form a closed uh, compact uh, connected oriented surface. So here is an example of a unicellular map of the torus. And well, then you can say, well, I, you can put a measure, a random, a random uh, measure on the set of unicellular maps. So as I said before, if, we, if I give you uh, a, a certain, a set of polygons, there's only a finite number of maps that you can build out of them. So if I give you a two and gone, uh, there's only a finite ways of gluing it uh, to itself so that you create a surface of genus G. And then you can then you can define properly this, uh, this object U and G, which is just a random uniform unicellular map of genus G and N edges. And this, uh, actually this, this uh, now this, this object, this unicellular maps, I'm gonna, I'm gonna consider them as metric spaces and I'm gonna endow them with a metric, with, at least with a distance, and um, which is almost natural. So like it starts with the graph distance. So the, like the graph distance between two points is just the length of the shortest path between them. I, I guess you all know that, but I'm gonna rescale this graph distance by this weird factor square root of 12 G over N. So that's my distance now. And my goal is to study the geometric properties of this, um, of this object Q and G as uh, both the size and genus go to infinity. And I don't specify uh, so much how they grow uh, uh, with respect to each other. The only thing that I require is that the genus goes to infinity as smaller of N. And in particular, this, uh, so this, this, um, this factor here is gonna tend to zero. So that's gonna turn my um, discrete graph metric into a continuous metric in the limit. All right, uh, is there any questions so far? Now that I've introduced maps, maybe I've been a bit fast. Well, all right, if there's no questions, then I will 
uh, talk about the second model uh, of uh, surfaces, of uh, random surfaces, which is hyperbolic surfaces. So this is not uh, my area of expertise. So maybe some of you uh, uh, actually know more about it than me. Uh, so please forgive me if there is a slight imprecisions, but I'm, I will try to not say anything that's too wrong. All right. <clears throat> so first, what is a hyperbolic surface? So a hyperbolic surface, uh, roughly speaking, is a smooth surface with a metric, so like a continuous metric, such that the, this metric defines a curvature, which is uh, minus one at all, uh, it, at all points. So in other words, my surface has to look locally like the hyperbolic plane around each point. And so I'm going to start with a particular uh, hyperbolic surface, uh, which is basically the building block uh, of all hyperbolic surfaces. Uh, it's called the hyperbolic pair of pens. So there's a cool uh, fact or a theorem, uh, however you want to call it, that um, if you prescribe three numbers, three positive numbers, A, B, and C, there exists a unique hyperbolic pair of pens with boundary lengths A, B, and C. So a pair of pens is just a sphere with three uh, boundaries. And I specify uh, the boundaries have to be geodesic, which roughly speaking means that a like a, a geodesic curve, it's just a curve that is locally shortest path uh, in layman terms. And now, with, now that we have these building blocks, we can start uh, building uh, more complicated hyperbolic surfaces. So, if you take a hyperbolic surface of uh, some genus, so the genus has to be uh, greater or equal to two, otherwise it's actually not possible to put a hyperbolic metric on the, on, on the surface. Um, then you can actually cut, you can, you can decompose every surface into uh, a, um, a list of pair of pens. So this is, yeah, this decomposition, uh, uh, what it says is that there exists a certain number of closed geodesics, such that if you cut along these closed geodesics, then you get a certain number of pair of pens. Uh, however, uh, just one important detail is that the choice of the curves is actually uh, not unique. Uh, there's many ways to divide your, uh, your, uh, your surface into pair of pens. And if you like, if you like this kind of details, it basically boils down to prescribing an underlying tribal and graph uh, to divide your uh, your surface into pair of pens. And so now, if I want to go the other way around to rebuild my uh, pair of pens, of course, I will have to specify my, to rebuild my surface. Sorry, out of my list of pair of pens, of course, I have to specify the length of all these uh, of all these curves. But also if I have, so if I want to glue them back together for, uh, they have to have the same length, but there's a sort of a twist factor. I can glue my pens like this or like that. So basically what it means is that for each uh, geodesic, I need to specify a length, uh, which is a positive number and a twist factor, which is a real number. And this set of coordinates is called the fenchel nielsen coordinates. And the cool fact is that it, uh, def it determines the surface uniquely. And so I have a set of coordinates in the, 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 the space of uh, hyperbolic surface, no, surfaces. Uh, now I can parameterize it. So the space of hyperbolic surfaces is um, called the Teichmüller space. And it's, uh, so I will denote it by TG and uh, the space of hyperbolic surface of genus G. And as you can see, it's just, uh, well, it's just uh, isomorphic to R plus times R to the 3G minus three. Um, but this is for the Teichmüller space, but we're actually not going to focus so much on the Teichmüller space. What we're going to do is uh, think about um, a quotient of this space, which is uh, the moduli space, Mg, which is roughly speaking uh, the Teichmüller space uh, up to isometri isometries. So I'm not going to dive into the details. I'm going to swipe that under the rug. But yeah, basically, uh, you can like, have a rough idea what it means to take, well, two surfaces are equivalent if there is isometry between them. But the problem is this thing is not easy to understand. These isometries are not easy to understand. 
And the fact is that actually um, you had this very nice Teichmuller space, which is very smooth. And now you're quotienting up to isometries, but then the orbits are not always the same at each point. So you're taking this nice space and this nice space TG and folding it up on itself and you to obtain MG, but the problem is then you create some singularities sort of, and it's not even a manifold anymore. However, we can still do some things about this wild moduli space. And there's a reason why we, we studied the moduli space, the weird moduli space and not the nice, be, nicely behaving uh, Teichmuller space. So this is a result of Volpert. Um, he showed that we can express a certain uh, volume form called the Weipetersen volume form. Just, oh, is there a question? Presumably need the gluing hypograph as well as the, yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's what I'm saying. Like the, the, the you need to prescribe the tribal graph that, uh, that determines your, uh, your surface. So this, this, the, the coordinates are not uh, unique. The choice of coordinates are not unique, but it's, it's just, you know, like every kind of space has different choices of coordinates. You just pick one. Does that answer the question? Or was it too? Uh, not, not quite. Don't you need more information than the coordinates? You need the coordinates plus which which triples uh, are attached to pairs of pants. Yeah, yeah, I mean it's um which triples? What do you mean triples? Which which three? The 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 uh, the, the graph thing <laughs> that says yeah, yeah, yeah. So you need like but the underlying the travel and graph, each each graph. Decorated graph, however you want to call it, determines uh, a, a system of coordinates. Uh, is, that, is that satisfying answer? You have many possible systems of coordinates, as many as traveling graphs that cut up your surface in in in, in pairs of points. But if each uh, underlying traveling graph uh, determines uh, determines determines a system of coordinates. Right, this, but a point in TG doesn't give you a surface unless you know which triangle graph you're talking about. If, if, if I mean, yeah, 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 I mean, a point, no, a point in TG, like you have to think of it uh, more abstractly, a point in TG is a surface. But then a list of coordinates, it means nothing if we don't know what coordinate system we're talking about. But it, it's the same in the, in the plane. Like if I give you X and Y, you know, if this is the basis or this is the basis, it's the same. Like it's not going to be the same coordinates, but point is a abstract point is, is always going to be the same. Uh, I don't know if that's that's a satisfying answer. Otherwise, I think it's it's just a, a little detail. It's not that important for the... So. We can come back to that later if you, if you want. But yeah, so what I wanted to say, so like the, this, this result, this great result of Volpert is that this, there's a volume form called the Valpetersen volume form that you can actually express first as the, the, the Lebesgue measure on these uh, uh, fenchel linsen coordinates, so this standard volume form. And so there, there, it's called the magic formula for many reasons, because this volume form, if you just define it like this, if you take this as a definition, it's well defined on, uh, on the Teichmüller space, but as I said, it, uh, the, the choice of coordinate is not unique. So the good thing is that this, this choice of, of, of a volume form is invariant under um, uh, isometry, like under the change of coordinates. And so, which makes it good because this, this, this volume form, which is well-defined on TG, descends on MG. And, um, and the best thing about it, as, at least for uh, probabilists like us, is that when you take this volume form uh, and you integrate it over the moduli space, now it's finite. So which allows us to define a probability measure, which we couldn't do on the attachment space because it's obviously of infinite uh, uh, volume. So now you can, you can take, you, can, you, you have a way to sample uh, um, a random hyperbolic surface at, uh, like yeah, some, uh, yeah, random hyperbolic surface, which is which you can't do because it's it's not a, you know, it's not a fine, which is not at least obvious because it's not a finite set. So this is what people have done. You can sample this 
random hyperbolic surface and then divide the Jessen measure. And um, let's say a decade ago, um, Mirzahani, as, as well as Good, Pali, and Young, uh, started studying the properties of this surface SG, the geometry properties uh, of the surface SG, as the genus goes to infinity. Um, yeah, so that, that was for the, the, the introduction to hyperbolic surfaces. And now I'm gonna talk about like a strange coincidence that we noticed with uh, Svante. Um, so basically, so yeah, I define two models of random surfaces and when you have like models of random surfaces and especially in high genus, so like both, both models were trying to understand what happens when the genus goes to infinity and they're still, well, trying to know what the surface looks like. You have to specify what observable you're looking for. And so what we did, uh, like the focus of this talk is about counting curves. Uh, so more, more precisely counting simple closed uh, short curves. So simple and closed curves, I mean, I think you, you, you know what it means. Uh, short for us, it means uh, of constant length Although the genus goes to infinity, we're going to count the, the curves of constant length. And there's still a bit of ambiguity by what I mean by curves, and it depends on the model. So I'm going to, I'm going to jump um, right into it now. So five years ago or so, uh, uh, a bit more maybe, Mirzahani and Petri uh, worked together and um, counted uh, the number of simple closed geodesics, so that's that's the, the right notion of curves in, in the hyperbolic surfaces. And you can, well, this is, you take your, your hyperbolic, random hyperbolic surface SG, and you can count uh, the number of, uh, of these curves uh, of length uh, in a given interval. And this is a random, uh, this is a random variable, of course, because the surface itself is, is, is random. And they have shown that it converges in distribution to a Poisson law of a certain parameter that can, you can see here, an integral of a hyperbolic cosine. So this is, it converges as the genus goes to infinity. And what we did last year with Svante Amson is that we took our uh, model of hyperbolic, uh, of, of unicellular maps, and we counted this time simple cycles. So that's the right notion of curves um, um, in, in, in the world of maps. And again, of length uh, in a given interval. So let me remind you that we have rescaled the graph distance. So that, that makes sense to have a, a continuous interval. And we have found that as the genus goes to infinity, we obtain exactly the same distribution. Uh, obtain a Poisson of, of, of the same exact same parameter. And well, the result is actually a bit stronger. It's not a, only a Poisson law, it's like a Poisson point process or something, like meaning that if you take different uh, separate intervals, then you have uh, joint convergence to a Poisson law and the Poisson laws are independent. But anyway, so that's that. To us, that was a really surprising result uh, that we obtain exactly the same, the same law, the same law for counting cycles. Of course, obtaining a Poisson law for counting cycles, uh, I guess many of you know that's, that's, that's something very standard. So that's not the fact that we have a Poisson law that is surprising, is that the fact that we have exact same parameter and that uh, we have, um, well, we have uh, no good reason why it has to be the same, except that this is two model of random surfaces as the genus goes to infinity. So the question is, well, yeah, is this just a coincidence? And well, I want to bet that there is something behind, behind that, but that, that this is not only a coincidence, and so, yeah, we made this conjecture. So I'm going to state it in a very vague version. But we made this conjecture that this hyperbolic surface SG and its uh, unicellular map UNG, they're the same in some sense as the genus goes to infinity. So of course you have to prescribe a well-chosen metric and say that there's a coupling, yada, yada, yada. But still, like the, our intuition is that there's more to it than just a numerical coincidence, because that's quite a, that's a quite precise coincidence. So we want some. We we, we wish that there's that there's something uh, behind that, and we have good reasons to think that there might be something. 
But so yeah, this is the the, the conjecture in in the vague uh, setting, uh, so to say. And all right, yeah. So I, I stated that this conjecture in a in a quite vague way, also because uh, like the con making the conjecture really precise, having a really precise conjecture requires some work. And in fact, we don't have a, a super precise conjecture as of now. We have like we have directions, but I believe that. It's going to get more and more precise as we progress towards this goal to like find out if these two models are really the same um, in the limit or not. What I can tell you about is uh, two uh, details that are important. The first thing is that hyperbolic surfaces, they're smooth objects. You have a continuous metric, everything happen is well, it is nice and well. Although maps, they're uh, highly fractal objects, as you could have seen on this, uh, what, what is it? Yeah, this uh, Brownian sphere, it's a fractal object, has host of dimension four, and it's like kind of built in maps to be like fractal objects. So, what we need to do is to try to remove the fractal part. And in general, this is the fractal part is everywhere, it's, it's, it's not identifiable. However, when you're working with high unicellular maps, you can easily identify the fractal part because a unicellular map, it looks like this. You have this two core, which the, this thing that we call the two core, and, and then attached to it, you have just dangling trees. And these dangling trees, they're, the, they're, they're, they're where the, the fractalness comes from in the case of unicellular map, not in the case of general maps. So, Actually, it's not the unicellular map itself that is going to be uh, the, that's going to be the, the the same as the unis the, as the hyperbolic surface. It's going to be its two core. And I mean that didn't uh, matter for what we did because we counted simple cycles. So if you do a simple cycle, you're never going to go into these trees. So that, of course you will get the same result. The other problem is that if you do, if you also consider the 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 your map just as a graph uh, in the limit it's going to look uh, it's going to look just like a metric graph it's not going to look like uh, there's going to be holes in there it's it's, it's not going to look like a um, a surface but well before that i defined uh, we have an easy fix to this one because before i defined maps as the gluing of uh, polynomials so, well, we can just say, well, our unicellular map is not only the graph that's uh, defined by the edges, but also the interior of the polygon. So if we just define our unicellular map as the gluing of a hyperbolic polygon, then, then, there's, there's, then there's a chance to make it work and have a complete uh, hyperbolic surface. But however, yeah, I'm still hiding things under the rug because the question is, what is the right hyperbolic polygon to have the same, uh, same, the same law? So this is this is still an open question so far. And I think the right metric is probably like the gram of Hausdorff distance on metric spaces. And I think possibly we need something stronger to make sense of the topology, because I think the results for uh, like um, separating curves uh, it could extend to separating curves. So like. That this is a pretty classical question in geometry, like to try to understand the length of the separating system, so the shortest curve that cuts your surface into two uh, two parts, uh, two parts with that both have genus. So, and this is not uh, included in the gram of cost of distance on metric spaces. It doesn't account for the topology. So maybe we need something stronger that that accounts for the topology. And so. The thing is, this conjecture is nice and all because we have two uh, different models of uh, random surfaces, and then we find out that they potentially be behave uh, similarly in the limit. So that contributes to this nice notion of universality. So that that's that's really cute and everything. But there is more practical uh, hopes for this uh, this conjecture. Uh, in particular, if if this is true in a strong enough sense, then we can transfer problems from one one world to the other and in particular transfer some hyperbolic problems to the problems of maps. And I believe that this is, the unicellular maps are easier to, uh, 
to tackle because there is this magic bijection that I'm going to tell you about uh, later. So we would transfer hyperbolic problems to basically problems with random trees, which we, which combinatorists and, and, and probabilists know quite well. And as, as, a, as an example, like there is uh, here, I'm stating like two, a couple of open problems, the problems that are still open hyperbolic surfaces in, for the surfaces SG, for instance, is uh, identifying what is the diameter of these surfaces. So we know that it's, um, logarithmic in G. So we have a bound uh, below and above. The bound below is something completely deterministic. The bound above comes from some spectral arguments. But we're wondering what is the right constant because well, most people believe that actually the diameter is equal with high probability to like it were the diameter divided by log G converges in probability is to a constant. And well, I'd say half of the people bet it's one, half of the people bet it's two. Maybe it's something else. I mean, probably one or two. And that would be nice to understand what, the, to know what the right constant is. And again, we can also like try to understand uh, spe some spectral properties like the spectral gap or the Chigo constant of, of, of these objects. And we don't even have to wait for the conjecture to be proven uh, to work uh, on these problems or uh, on these models of maps. All right, uh, yeah, just now I will just quickly finish with some ideas of proof of how you prove these results, uh, both in the world of hyperbolic surfaces and in the world of, of, of maps. So it's two uh, quite different techniques. And well, it's gonna be very high level. So no, no technical details. Um, but yeah, I'm starting with something I bet that all of you know and probably know much better than I do. But well, both uh, for both uh, results, when you're counting curves in, in, in hyperbolic surfaces or in maps, we use the method of moments, which basically boils down to saying, well, under reasonable assumptions, uh, well, if you, if you have a sequence uh, whose moments converge to the moments of a certain distribution, then the sequence converges uh, in distribution to, to your random variable. So like Xn converges towards X if all the finite moments converge to the right finite moments. Well, at least for Poisson law, it works. Uh, probably there's some wicked uh, probability laws which uh, make this principle not work. But here, everything works well, everything behaves nicely. And well, the idea, uh, roughly speaking, uh, to calculate the moments, uh, if my variable x uh, counts some curves of a given length, then the expectation of x of r is just the number of surfaces with r marked curves divided by the total number of surfaces. I mean, I'm using quotes because the number is not always well defined. It's, it's defined when you have finite uh, sets like maps, but it's not, this is not well defined for um, hyperbolic surfaces, but there is an easy fix to this principle. I'm just yeah, saying it roughly speaking. And yeah, so the method for hyperbolic surfaces, well, you just, I'm just gonna say, I'm just gonna do the expectation, but if you, and then the rest works a bit the same, but if you say XJ is the number of closed simple geodesics in some random hyperbolic uh, Valpetus and surface of genus G with a given length, then the, the, the principle is it's quite easy. So if you, if you have a marked uh, geodesic, then you can just cut it and you obtain a, uh, you obtain a surface uh, with genus G minus one and two geodesic boundaries of the same length. Well, you might tell me that's not exactly true because maybe the geodesic was here it's also easy to, and, and it, it would divide its surface into two uh, big chunks, but it's actually kind of easy to, to show that this doesn't happen in the, most probably doesn't happen uh, when the curves are short. And so now you can apply the principle of, uh, before, like dividing just numbers of surfaces. And instead of using numbers, well, you just use the Valpetus and volumes. And the good thing is there's also moduli space of surfaces with boundaries. 
So then the expectation of X of G is just an integral from A to B of the right volume. So this is the volume of uh, surfaces with the marked uh, geodesic, which is the same as the, the, so the, the modular space of surfaces with two geodesic boundaries, but the genus is one less. And you divide by the, by the total volume, you integrate between A and B. And well, to make it work, you need uh, Mirzahani's uh, estimates uh, for the val Peterson volumes in large genus. So that's that's also that's that's where the like the, the hard part of the proof is hidden. Actually, that's, the rest is pretty standard. Um, so that's for the the hyperbolic surfaces. So that was just for the for the um, that was just for the like the how you get the expectation. So how you get the the parameter, and well to establish the Poisson, I guess you. All know this better than me actually, but it just boils down to saying, well, if you have two cycles, typically if they're not if they're not the same cycle there, and then they're disjoint, and three cycles, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Same, same holds. But if you can prove this, then you can prove uh, the Poisson approximation. For maps, the it works actually quite differently because. We cannot use this method here because if we cut cycles, then we are gonna go from maps with one phase to maps with three phases, and then it becomes quite hard to handle. We'll have this magic bijection of Chaplis, Ferret, and Fusy um, with uh, so-called C decorated trees. So a C decorated tree is just a plane tree uh, with a permutation of its vertices. So basically you have, uh, yeah, here it's, it's represented here, you have like cycles on the vertices, so like little arrows. And the cycles have to only be odd, of odd length. And the underlying graph of a C decorated tree is obtained when you merge the vertices who belong to the same cycle of the permutation. So you can see here, this C decorated tree, this is the underlying graph of the, of the C decorated tree. So each cycle of the permutation is going to be a, a, a vertex of the underlying graph. And so you can say the ran, uh, you can also sample random uh, uniform C decorated trees with energies and the right number of uh, cycles in the permutation. Uh, so we call it TNG and the bijection of Chapi Ferrin Fusi, what it says. Uh, stated in, probability, in probabilistic terms is that the underlying graphs of both UNG and TNG have the same low. So the underlying graph of the, of the map is uh, when you just forget about the topological structure, you just look at the graph structure. So you forget a bit of information. And here, while well, the underlying graph of a C decorated tree, I just define it to, to you. And so this is how we use, actually this is, the, we, we use this magic bijection to count cycles because we don't need the, topo the, the topological structure of the map. Well, the, 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 just the graph structure is enough to count cycles. It's not, it's not gonna change anything. And then just very quickly, how do we find what is a cycle in the, in the, in the unicellular map? So sorry, this is gonna go a bit fast because I realized I'm running out of time kind of, but a cycle in the, if you think about it, for a minute, a cycle in the map is just a set of paths in the in the tree, such that the endpoints of the paths are merged together, one by one, like two by two. Sorry. So here I am representing it. Uh, this is the C decorated tree, and this is just the uh, well the. I let's say that the the. the the procedure to obtain the underlying graph merges these two vertices, these two vertices, and these two vertices, then you can see that it forms a cycle. Of course, you have more technical things to like try to understand what it means to be a simple cycle, but I guess, well, with a bit of work, it's, uh, it's not that hard once you have this idea. This is the key idea to decompose. So we started by trying to understand cycles in maps. Now we have cycles in C decorated trees, and basically, we'll, it basically boils down now to counting uh, paths of a given length in, 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 in random trees, so which is something that you can quite easily do, and that we did. And so you same, same as before, with this you can get the expectation, and then you can 
with a bit more technical work proof that uh, you know, with the method, the method of moment works and that you get uh, that you get the Poisson approximation. So that was for the ideas of the proof. I'm just going to end this talk with uh, a couple additional questions. Um, the open questions. So of course, well, the, the main open question is the conjecture. Um, but uh, yeah, there's more more comments and questions. I mean, this 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 is kind of far reaching. So that's just going. This is pure speculation. But um, first thing is that there are if you take hyperbolic surfaces, there are there is it's if you take a hyperbolic surface, there's a way to to find a unicellular map in a hyperbolic surface. It's like called Pen Penner's uh, spine construction. If you take a given point and uh, then the set of uh, the set of points who have more than one uh, geodesic that go to this point, it forms uh, it forms a tri trivalent graph embedded on the surface. Sorry, it's kind of hard to visualize uh, when I explain it in five seconds like this. But there is the point is the spine construction builds unicellular maps in hyperbolic surfaces. And actually, this construction is the equivalent of something called the Schaeffer bijection on maps, which also builds a unicellular map inside a general map. So we have two, two very similar equivalent constructions on these two objects. Now I presented you another magic bijection, which is called the Chapuis-Ferré fuzzy bijection. It works on maps. And the natural question is, do we have a similar thing for hyperbolic surfaces? That's an open question. Um, yeah, uh, also in the universality, uh, on the uh, universality topic, uh, Timothy Bed and Nicolas Curien proved uh, a nice, very nice result is that um, if you take the hyperbolic sphere, now a hyperbolic sphere with many cups, so many spikes, and you let the number of spikes go to infinity, then in the scaling limit, you recover the brown sphere. So exactly the same as the, as the, as the, as the maps. So that, so that was, that's one result of, of uh, limiting behavior. Now, like the same question can apply. Now, if you study the benjamin Sharm limit, you want to study, so the benjamin Sharm the local limit. Now of the hyperbolic G torus with many cusps, as both the number of cups and the genus go to infinity, can you obtain a similar result to uh, the one of Pizinski and myself uh, for uh, the local limit of high genus maps? And um, finally, a bit of enumeration for those of you who like enumeration. Um, with Thomas, we proved also some, uh, some a uh, first step towards uh, asymptotic enumeration of high genus maps. And we proved that the number of uh, triangulations of genus G and uh, uh, size N when N and G go to infinity, it behaves like so. So this is not an asymptotic equivalent because it's up to sub-exponential terms. Uh, so in N to the 2G exponential of N times a function of the ratio N over G. And I strongly believe that actually this, this, this shape of, of the asymptotic formulas, it, were, it, it, it actually um, holds for many, many uh, models of surfaces. So my vague conjecture is that the same holds uh, also for the val Peterson volume of the moduli space uh, uh, of uh, genus G surfaces with N uh, punctures. All right, and I think I have spoken enough. I'm going to stop and uh, thank you for atten your attention. Thank you very much, Baptiste, for a, a lovely talk. Um, so I'm going to invite people to ask questions. I know Alex has one. Maybe I'll start just by asking one myself. Mm -hmm. um, how important is it that your maps be unicellular? Or is that just sort of convenient? Do, do you believe this would be true beyond the unicellular setting? Mm. So what I believe is that unicellular maps, uh, I mean, if you do like all the arrangements that I, I spoke about, um, they will correspond to the hyperbolic surfaces, the smooth hyperbolic surfaces. 
because in the maps you can get rid of the fractal part quite easily. When you get rid of the fractal part, then maybe you can recover the the, the hyperbolic uh, surfaces, the smooth hyperbolic surfaces. As I said in the previous slide, I believe that for general maps, this, as there's no way to shave off the, the fractal part because it's everywhere, I think the right model is maps with a lot of cusp. So uh, I, I don't know if I know, I didn't say what a cusp is, but basically you can define uh, hyperbolic surfaces with boundaries. And if you take the length of the boundary to be zero, basically there's like, with the hyperbolic metric, it's gonna get you can infinite spike. And if you have a bunch of infinite spikes and then well, there's some smoothing procedures and something, there's a lot of technical detail, details behind that. I don't wanna say something wrong here, but I believe that to obtain the fractal part, you need this, this, this number of cusps. And this is my question, like, can you, I mean, we believe that it's possible. We don't think we, we don't, well, Thomas and I believe that it's possible that there is a result, a similar result, like the spenny uh, convergence of this hyperbolic g torus with many cusps. However, we have no idea how it, how it would work, but it seems reasonable to think that it, this, would, this would work. But if you want the, the, the fractal part, you need the, the cusps. Thank you. Alex. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you for a lovely talk. Um, so I had a question about this, this magic bijection. So I mean, you've got this, this um, space of unicellular maps. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to prove theorems about it. Is, is the magic bijection um, kind of, is, in some sense, necessary at the moment for, for getting at it? Or are there other ways in? Um, actually, let me ask a second half of the question as well. Um, if you want to generate one of these things uniformly at random, um, given that you're conditioning on the genus, Mm -hmm. um, does does the magic bijection give you a way of doing that? So if you, if you just want to you know, run a program and, and, and generate with some big parameters, mm, yes. Um, so, but if you if you want to generate the underlying graph, for sure. If you want to, if you give you the underlying graph of a map, it's not given that. If I, if I give you a graph, it's not given that it's possible to under, uh, to embed it in a genus G surfaces surface, sorry. And on the other hand, maybe there's many ways of doing so. And Guillaume calls it a bit of a quantum bijection because it's it's the bijection doesn't work like here is my 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 tree and I obtain this map. So there, there there's a bit there's something weird happening. It, it, it preserves the underlying graph, but you don't know, there's no like one-to-one -one, uh, joining of the, of the, like here's a tree, here's a map, and uh, there's an arrow. I believe like the, I think, I mean, I think you can also prove that the real picture is like, you have these two sets and you have weighted arrows so that the, 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 the so, but if you want just the graph structure, yeah, of course you can you can do that. You just pick a tree randomly, uniformly at random. It's really easy to to generate a tree. It's very fast. I think it's linear time. And uh, but if if you want to generate a a, um, a glued version of a polygon, I mean, if you want to generate the surface, then yeah, yeah then that's that's the. Um, so if you want to, if you want to generate the surface. Um, I think I think there's a good reason why you cannot recover the, the map. However, there's a simpler version. If you want uh, now trivalent maps, so maps with only vertices of degree three, there's an exact bijection. There's something that creates it, uh, and then that 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 creates it uh, explicitly. So if you want to generate all the trivalent maps, unicellular maps, then this you can do. And how do you control the genus when you do that? Oh, it's just uh, the genus and the size are coupled. They're, they're not independent. Oh, okay. It's just, well, if the genus goes to infinity, the, 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 the size goes to infinity as well. Okay, thank you. Oliver has a question in the chat. I don't know if you can see it. Is there a simple reason why it's odd cycles in the permutation? Um, 
Yes. Then let me think. Um, so the 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 bijection of Chapuis. I mean, it's it's actually several papers before they came with this. Uh, it's, it's Guillaume who started this thing, and then they 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 closed the the, the sealed the, the deal with the uh, Ferrand Fusil. But it it's based on the the composition of certain uh, vertices, special vertices, and more precisely, special corners called trisections, where you split in three. I mean, the easy version is when you split your vertex in three. And sometimes you split your vertex in three uh, things and it works and you, you, have, you had a map of genus G and then you obtain a map of genus G minus one. Uh, but sometimes it doesn't work and you have to split something in three again. So now you have five pieces and maybe sometimes you have to, uh, one of the pieces still is misbehaving. So you still have to split it in three again and it's, and you have to split it in, 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 in and then you get five, seven pieces and so on and so forth. I don't know if it's a, if it's a good reason. Another indication is in the, in the Euler formula, you have this 2G, so it, it, like the, like, you know, you have vertices minus edges plus faces equals two minus 2G. So if you want to, um, to, to lower the genus by some, number then you have to for instance add an even number of vertices if you want to keep the number of faces and edges constant i don't know if it's a satisfying reason but I, yeah 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 one is anybody else okay if not what i'm going to do is stop recording and then propose that we give uh at least a, a proper round of applause by everybody unmuting themselves so.